this meeting, so I'm glad that um, there's enough of us that it will make sense to do a breakout group, um, mostly just to show that like it's a tool that we can use. Um, and I think that it would be best if that part like isn't recorded. Um, cool. Um, so yeah, my name is Remus and um, this is actually today is my one year anniversary of moving to California, which is like a really awesome like thing for me to celebrate because I have learned so much um, since I've come here and it just yeah, it like means a lot for me to be here. Um, and also I had gotten a little bit involved with organizing uh, before I moved to California, but nothing like what happened once I like landed in Berkeley and got the chance to kind of be like a tourist at a bunch of different, mostly environmental organizations. Um, but through a you know series of events that allowed me to um, live off of unemployment money. I'm now organizing full time. And um, in in that, I spend a lot of time facilitating meetings, which are now entirely online. So while I've never done a training like this, um, this is coming from a lot of personal experience and hopefully it can be useful. Um, and yeah, that experience is largely from the Sunrise Movement. A lot of these slides are pulled from the Sunrise Movement, um, but I also am a facilitator with a grassroots project called the Autonomous University of Political Education. Um, and so a lot of my methodology also comes from my work there. And I wanted to just give a quick agenda. Um, so we'll do some intros and then um, spend a little bit of time finding common ground online, um, which is maybe gonna be kind of like a meta opportunity to both like use some skills and discuss like what kind of spaces we wanna create online. Um, we'll have a discussion on the art of facilitation and um, end by just going through some tools that are available for us and then have a quick closing. Um, so yeah, for introductions, um, I know that it seems like we might already all know each other other than myself. Um, but I'd hope that we could do a go around with names, pronouns, um, your campus or location, whether your accessibility needs are met, and what the strike means for you. Um, and I'm happy to start. Um, my name is Remus. I prefer she and her pronouns. I am not a member of a campus, but I am located in Berkeley. Um, and my accessibility needs are that I'm a little bit nervous, which has actually been um, somewhat assuaded by the fact that this is a smaller call, um, but in order to uh, help with that, I might need some encouragement at some point. Um, and for me, the strike is incredibly inspiring. I really believe in the power of strike, and it means a lot to see, um, you know, the the students and um, and grad students coming together to demonstrate like what the value of their labor is, and to ask for a better future and to ask for a change. And it's something for me that shows the power of these movements and our ability um, to, to really come together and, and do this work. So I just feel so grateful for the opportunity to get to connect with y'all um, while you're making this powerful movement. And I will pass over to Juliet if uh, you're available to make an introduction. Yeah, hey y'all, Juliet, she, her. Um, my uh, accessibility context would be about for a walk with some ambient traffic noise. Um, other than that, I'm good. Uh, and the strike to me is the um, kind of dream of militant grassroots unionism that doesn't rely on the frankly racist history of top-down bureaucratic conservative unionism in the U.S. Um, and what the what the dream would be of solidarity also beyond our own working conditions to other workers um, in the context of campus but also you know across borders so that's me. Uh, Isabella? Yeah, hi everybody. Um, so my name is Isabella Fossey and my pronouns are she, her. 
I'm a grad student at the University of Arizona in Tucson, but I'm currently in St. Louis, Missouri. Um, and my accessibility needs are met, everything's good um, there. And the strike to me, I think coming from a university that is very weakly organized, if at all, um, but so close to California <laughs> geographically, I think uh, it's been a really inspiring example um, and I think given me hope for ways that we can get our own university organized, especially among the grad students, because we are nowhere near the level of <laughs> organization that's going on um, in the University of California system. So yeah, really grateful to be here. Thank you guys. Melanie? So I'm Melanie, I use they and she pronouns. Um, I'm a grad student at UCSB, but I'm mostly living and working in the Bay. So I'm also plugged into UC Berkeley's organizing. Um, my accessibility needs are mostly met. I may turn off my video and like do some stretching or something because I've been on calls for a while. I did a training before this as well. And what does the strike mean to me? This is like, God, we don't get to answer these like meaningful questions in all the logistical work we're doing all day. But um, I really resonated with what Juliet said about an opportunity to redefine the union from the inside out. And I also, I think that um, just something transformative happens when we begin to really understand ourselves as workers um, that have like labor to withhold um, and resist that narrative that we're apprentices and students. Um, and for me, I don't know, I'm, I'm somebody that's always looking for a spark and I feel like um, it's beautiful to see not just this strike, but like Red Fred in general, just the way that teachers have stepped up and like reimagined what um, a strike can fight for, that like we can have strikes that fight for us and our students and our students parents and our communities and like none of those things have to be pitted against each other um yeah anyways i'm rambling so that's just yeah what thank a great morning um uh, also julia welcome um thank you for joining us and you're right on time if you'd like to make an introduction Sure. Hi. Um, apologies for being late. I'm really excited about this teach-in, so thank you for holding it. And yeah, my name is Julia. I use she and they pronouns. I'm at UC Berkeley. Um, and my access needs are met right now. Thank you for asking. And um, what does this strike mean? Right now, it means that I get to create connections with people I wouldn't normally connect with. And that's feeling really valuable in a moment when we're really isolated. Thank you, Julia. Um, cool. So yeah, I did wanna actually take a moment like in the spirit of um, how to facilitate trainings online to recognize that accessibility needs um, can feel really different online than in person. And I actually pulled these examples from the Strike University um, like facilitator manual um, that was provided to me when I signed up to um, do this training. And so I just wanted to recognize that there can be um, lots and lots of different types of accessibility needs and they might come in the form of statements such as I have kids and I need to hop off, or I have back pain, so I'll need to walk around. Um, they also can come in the form of requests, um, such as I prefer to use the chat rather than speak, and um, please do not use any graphic descriptions of violence. Um, and I think that it's important, like whenever we're putting together uh, meetings or workshops or events, um, to put some time into how we might be able to meet these needs. Um, yeah, I am gonna be sharing the manual. Um, the end of this slide, or the end of this presentation has a slide um, full of resources. Um, and I guess if you wanna, if everyone wants to drop their um, email address into the chat, then I will email you um, the slides afterwards. Um, I will also be like dropping 
some things into the chat as we go. Um, so yeah, I think that it's important to consider how we might be able to meet accessibility needs. And like for me, this is in a lot of ways new territory. Um, so I made this very short list and I invite um, everybody to add to this list um, as a part of this discussion. Um, some ways that I feel like we can meet accessibility needs on Zoom include um, like using the call-in feature, like for folks that might have unstable internet um, or um, folks like Juliet that need to be on a walk. Um, I know you might be using the, um, like using your data for the video, but there's also a call-in feature so that you can um, call in to any of these um, Zoom discussions only using a phone service. Um, Zoom also does have a closed captioning option, which I have never used, but if you are the host of the Zoom account, um, there is a way to enable closed caption settings. Um, there's also opportunities to work with um, like closed caption, uh, like if you're hosting a large call, um, you can hire someone to provide closed captioning, um, which might be more, more accurate. Um, and I've also seen Zoom calls where they had a uh, American Sign Language interpreter able to like provide access in that way. Um, and then I think that the chat box is a really fantastic feature. Um, thank you, Julia, for demonstrating that we can ask questions whenever they come up and the chat box can use emphasis, but it also um, can be a way um, to share your thoughts and share your voice um, if you're in a place where you might not want to speak out loud or share video or something like that. Um, so I do invite, um, if anybody on the call right now um, has any um, ideas or experience with how to use Zoom um, to accommodate different accessibility needs, um, I do invite you to, to share them. Um, and we, I can read them out of the, of the chat. But um, it's, I think it's just helpful to sort of like keep that in mind that like we do want to continue trying to meet people where they're at and recognize that everybody is human and we show up to these spaces um, from lots of different perspectives and realities. So with that, um, I actually wanted to do a bit of an exercise. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen, screen for a second. And I recognize that um, not everybody might be in a place where they are um, able to participate with this, um, which is fine. It'll be like a little bit more of a one-sided exercise in that case. Um, but I'm gonna drop into the chat um, this presentation. And so you should have edit access to the presentation if you wanna, um, yeah, Julia, I, I, I do agree that the closed captioning is done by hand. Um, I, 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 I have seen that there's some attempts to do it automatically, um, which I don't know like how successful that's been, but I, I know that the folks that have actually provided it will hire somebody to do it by hand. Um, and yeah. just to mention that access team at UCB has created a guide for making meetings accessible, um, specifically how to do live transcription. So if you wanted to share that link, then um, we can include it in the follow-up email. Did you want to speak at all to that? Yeah, I can, I can put together. We made a, a, a disability, um, COLA Disability Activism Toolkit, and then um, in it we have some resources for like how to make um, Zoom meetings more accessible. Um, yeah, uh, yeah, just that there's, there, there are a couple different strategies that folks, um, some folks at Berkeley put a lot of like kind of research into. So yeah, Otter AI being the oh, cool. one that we're currently using. Okay. Um, cool. And it's pretty easy to set up and I can, if anyone is running it with their meetings, I'm happy to, um, to talk you through how to um, set it up. That's awesome. Um, yeah, thank you for sharing that. Uh, so I see that there's one anonymous anteater um, that has already jumped into this activity, which is great. Um, I don't know who the anonymous anteater is, but um, oh, it's Melanie. Cool. Um, so Julia or Isabella or I think Juliet, if you're on a walk, then probably 
um, this will be missed, but I will, I will try and share my screen so you can see the slides updating as we go. All right, we've got now an anonymous Nyan cat, which is wonderful. Um, so yeah, if we wanted to just collaborate on what community agreements um, would we like to bring into online spaces? Um, like one of the ones that I love is mute when not speaking. Speak from the eye. Oh, this is great. Generative listening, ask questions. Did I understand right? Could you say more? Maybe just online in the chat. Thank you, Julia, for sharing that. I'm seeing ask, don't assume. So we'll take maybe just one more minute to generate uh, some community agreements, um, which we would like to see happening online. Remus, can you say more about what you mean when you say community agreements? I mean it in a pretty general sense about just, um, you know, I think that like, Sunrise has some community agreements that are like, um, you know, be present in the space, remove distractions um, while you're on calls together. Um, so I, I think the, like for me, I've been in a, a lot of groups that use this phrase community agreements to mean like a pretty broad range of everything from like behaviors to aspirations to, um, like just um, ways that they want to um, relate to one another. And, and so I, I'm happy to sort of take this in the broadest of terms. And I'll, I'll write that one down. That's like be present, remove distractions. Um, and this is meant to just be like a kind of like broad brainstorm. Um, and I'm appreciating that folks have added a number of ideas onto this chat. Um, so I wanna invite us um, now that we can see that a bunch of different people have added um, some ideas. If, if folks wanna grab these little X's that are in the corner um, of the frame, then you can mark um, which of the thoughts really resonate for you. So if, we were, if you wanted to maybe choose three um, of the ideas that have been generated here that feel for you like the ones that you would really like to see like brought forward um, in our call today or in calls in general, um, then this is sort of modeling a way that we can um, like harvest a lot of different ideas and then um, get a sense of like where there's um, like a lot of support. And I'm, I'm gonna put an X on whoever just wrote, commit to responding to harm, ooch, ouch, um, oops and ouch, but like accountability. I like that one a lot. Um, so yeah, if um, in the past when I've done this exercise, it's, it's really effective if you have like, maybe like eight to 10 people on a call, um, because it's a way that you can like, gather a lot of ideas and then um, see, you know, which ideas generate the most excitement. Um, and it's also, I think, really nice, even when we're in online spaces, to have the opportunity to collaborate together. Um, and so I invite anybody to feel free um, to use this template. Um, this is a template that was created by Training for Change, um, which many of the um, suggestions throughout 
this presentation are inspired by Training for Change. Um, they also have a great manual, which we'll link to at the end. Um, so I'm gonna go back to sharing the screen. And um, yeah, so another one of these sorts of exercises, which um, has been helpful for me in the past is um, this idea of kind of using a spectrum. And so in this example, um, we could use the community agreement of step up and step back um, and just ask ourselves, like, where do I fall on this spectrum? Um, am I somebody who's generally quiet and I need time before I'll jump into the discussion, which um, we would mark as a one? Or am I somebody who it's really easy for me to be the first person to speak um, and I would mark myself as a five? Or am I somewhere in between that spectrum? And so I invite everybody to take a moment to consider where you fall on that spectrum and to type that into the chat. Thank you, Melanie, for being the first to jump in with saying that <laughs> it's hard. <laughs> I appreciate that. Oh, I think you're muted. Wait, which one is five and which one is one on step up, step back? Or um, also, I, there was an addition of like move up, move back, because step is emphasized on a certain kind of movement that not everyone can do. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I appreciate that. Um, and so, let me see. I'll I'll make that modification. Um, move up. Move I think back. someone did it already. On the oh, okay. Slide. But not on the next slide. And yeah. Is it still sharing or did it stop sharing? Also, welcome, Cass. Hello. It's uh, still sharing. Okay. Um, oh, sc you mean screen sharing? Yeah. Not screen sharing. Yeah, okay. it's not. Yeah. I'll share my screen. Um, Cass, do you want to take a second to introduce yourself? Um, we went around with our names and our pronouns that we like to use, as well as the location that we're calling from and our accessibility needs. Yeah, hi. Um, I'm Cass, uh, she, they. I'm from UCSC, and that's where I'm currently calling from right now. Um, was it, what else? No accessibility needs. Um, I think that's it. Hi, we everyone. Asked, we asked the question, um, oh. what, um, what does the strike mean to you? I guess the strike really, it means things to me, not only on like a personal level, but like a larger meaning in that it's such a fundamental thing that people should be having these payments, these rights, and, you know, the needs they have to live and pursue education. And that um, on a personal level, it means a lot that I have a lot of personal friends um, that, you know, cannot live and cannot do what they want to do because, you know, these stupid things that the university <laughs> refuses to give them. So, um, yeah. Yeah, thank you, Cass. Thank you for sharing that. Um, so, yeah, we're, we're trying out this exercise um, where we're using a spectrum to, um, to share where we fall on the spectrum of move up or move back. Um, and so we're using a one as somebody who is easy to speak first. And, um, or sorry, a one is somebody who is generally quiet and a five is someone who is easy to speak first. Um, and I appreciate, uh, Julia, you modeling how um, we can use this to show um, nuance. Um, so Julia says, I'm a five in small groups, as you can tell, and a two in large groups. Um, and Julia has been sharing some like really awesome um, like tools and pamphlets. Um, so I, like, we do appreciate the ways that Julia has been jumping in. Would anybody else like to share about um, what number they might use on this spectrum and why? I know um, Isabella mentioned that they were kind of working and Juliet is um, also a bit distracted. Um, but Cass, would you be interested in jumping in? Yeah, totally. Um, I think for me, it doesn't really depend on the size of the group. It depends more of like the context and who's in the group. 
because if I'm comfortable with a group and we're talking about something I'm, you know, have background on, I'm comfortable to talk about, I can easily talk and step in. But if it's something that I'm not accustomed to, then I need to like take a moment and kind of think about what I'm going to say and when to say it. Yeah. Awesome. Um, so yeah, I mean, this type of spectrum um, can be really helpful online. Um, in general, like I'm somebody who in, um, in person, it's very easy for me to be the first person to speak. But online, um, it's actually very hard for me to be the first person to speak. And um, often um, having a prompt, um, like using the chat box to say like, okay, like, where do you fall on the spectrum? Like, what's your opinion on this? Like type a number. Um, and then getting an invitation to um, describe why I chose that um, can be really helpful. And so I think that finding ways um, to sort of harvest people's opinions um, using the chat or using different forms of representation can be really helpful online, um, especially if you're trying to get um, like the sort of temperature of a large group, um, because often folks will not speak up as readily in online spaces. Um, okay. So I also wanted to take a moment just to kind of like ground us um, in like, you know, the ways that we want to show up for each other and um, the fact that the, all of the work that we're doing as organizers is work that comes from, um, you know, who we are as people. And a lot of the basis of this work is about personal relationships. Um, and so I was hoping that we could use the breakout room feature which um, if, uh, let's see, I think the privilege marginalization in the room in relation to my own influence, whether or not I choose to speak. Yeah, thank you, Melanie. Um, that's a great point. Um, so for Isabella and Juliet, um, would you be interested in joining a breakout room or do you feel like you don't have capacity um, based on where you're at to have a one-on-one -on -one conversation right now? Uh, this is Juliet. Thanks for asking. Yeah, I could do a breakout group. Okay. And um, Isabella? Yeah, I, I definitely can. Okay. I can sure. Um, So Melanie, do you mind setting breakout rooms um, that are one-on-one? -on -one? Um, and we're going to take um, four minutes each so that um, we can ask the question about, so that each of us can share a time when we helped someone through a rough time. Um, so if you want to just like think back on your personal experience, and this can really be anything, um, you know, any experience in your life when you were able to show up for someone else and help them through a difficult situation. And yeah, we'll, we'll take four minutes and we'll try and get like a one minute warning before we switch to the other person. Remus, I think that um, because I'm just a co-host, I'm not seeing the option to set up breakout rooms, but so I wanted to ask if you have that option. Okay, I have the option. So I will... Um, okay, I'm gonna manually create breakout rooms. I'm also just gonna let everyone know we are recording this, um, which you should have gotten information about that at the beginning of the meeting or when you entered, but we're, um, I'm gonna pause the recording whenever we're in breakout rooms and you can request at any time in the meeting for the recording to be paused if you wanna share something that you just don't want to be shared with others. So just FYI. Cool. Um, Isabella? Um, cool. So yeah, thank you for taking that moment to um, to ground in some stories. Um, and I actually would love to um, reflect back on what some of the themes that might have come up um, in those stories uh, were for you. So in each of those stories, um, could you share some things that you did um, that supported the other person um, and like how you were able to show up and what characteristics that had? Um, I can speak. Uh, I talked about that um, it was being um, for, I had a friend who uh, experienced a death in the family, and so I was there for her, and it was being there for her in multiple parts of her life, not only, um, you know, academically, but in her life and her chores with her other members of her family, just showing up in different spaces.
Cool. So I, I'm interpreting that as showing up as a whole person. Does that feel like a good reflection of what you said? Yeah, definitely. Cool. Um, does somebody else um, want to jump in with something, some characteristic of what you shared? Oh, also, um, Cass is going to have to step out in five minutes. Um, Cass, would you have any interest in, um, in sharing back um, before you have to leave? OK, yeah, Cass might have already had to go. Um, but um, uh, Isabella or Juliet? Um, I could share a little bit of what we talked about. Um, we kind of got derailed talking about facilitation, actually. Um, and how kind of the way that we show up for people is very different and the way that we show up um, in collective spaces, be them digital or in real life, um, can be really complicated and like, oh, sorry, that's the baby. Um, so yeah, we got a little uh, derailed on that. Um, so I don't know if Melanie, you wanna add any of that? Um, no, that was good. I think maybe some of the reflection, I found our conversation really, really interesting and, but I think probably it'll be relevant for what we talk about later. So we can just bring it back. Yeah. So I, I, I'm hearing that, um, that, that there's a need to show up a bit differently in personal settings and in organizational setting spaces, um, which I think makes sense. Like we have different levels of trust um, in different contexts and that can reflect back our behavior. Um, and like what would be supportive in some contexts um, wouldn't feel as appropriate in others. Um, so I think that's also kind of maybe a bit of like reading the room. Uh, Julia, would you? One thing I just wanted to add. One thing that um, that Juliet shared in our conversation is how difficult it is to read the room online. And um, I'd be really interested in talking later with folks about like ways to use technology to do that. Trying to read a digital space. Cool. Um, one thing that came up for me in, in my story was that listening was like a really major part of um, how I was able to show up for for my friend um, that felt like kind of at the at the core of it which I know it's like I think that's also one of the things that might feel harder in a digital space um, because so much of listening happens um, with body language and, and with the kind of energy but yeah, like in, in my context, like it was over a phone call. And, um, and so I think it was also very much about like asking questions. Um, would anybody else like to reflect back on a characteristic that, that showed up um, in your conversation? Yeah, uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, I was talking about um, an experience during, um, actually it was during union bargaining, um, during a JC um, that I think Juliet was at. Hi, Juliet. Um, <laughs> and just about like how we created like a support pod. Um, yeah, just like having an affinity group of trusted people who actually, I ended up getting to know like through the, the the organizing space. We kind of created our own like small relational network within that. Um, just how important that is, you know. Like I don't know, in um, our small groups 
to to do work that is more like intimate and relationally based and that like that can be a part of how the larger groups can feel safe or how we can like even within that small group collectively respond to challenges within the larger group nice yeah thank you so much for sharing that um i wrote down um like creating trust and um like creating a support pod um which i think that that's really important um so yeah I'm, the reason that i wanted to generate sorry can list, i add one more thing absolutely. just a just a citation that that's um from mia mingus's um transformative justice and survivor support kind of pedagogy of like creating pods as um vehicles for accountability Yeah, thank you so much. I'm not sure, did I spell that correctly? If you can see the screen. Um, well, yeah, so yeah. I cannot see the screen, sorry. I, yeah, so I, I tried to add, um, I tried to add that in. Um, okay, Melanie is also stepping up for a second. Um, so yeah, the reason that I wanted to do this exercise um, is to recognize that, um, being a facilitator in a lot of ways is about um, like showing up uh, as the person that you are and and being a human and that um, you know all of us already really do know how to be facilitators um, I feel like in this group in particular um, that this might feel a little bit redundant because I can see that there's like a really high level of um, like care and um, discernment around how to show up for other people. Um, but just to like ground ourselves in the fact that um, we can sort of try to create spaces um, with the same methodology that we would want to like show up for a good friend um, and like bring that level of like care and trust and love into the rooms. Um, and that I think that if we sort of start from that point and sort of ground ourselves in like how we want to be, um, you know, how we want to show up as humans, then we can create rooms um, that can reach um, greater levels of trust and um, and hopefully like help people to come together. Um, this is also to help us recognize that um, facilitation is an art. Um, it's definitely a social art, um, and it's a way that we hold and support our friends to make better decisions and have a smoother process. Um, so this means that what works sometimes may not work all the time and that we have to keep learning and growing. Um, so thank you for uh, like taking this time to, uh, to try and find the ways in which we can um, sort of show up fully um, in, this, in this work. Um, okay, so. I think that if I'm presenting, it won't allow me to um, like edit live, which is one of the reasons why I've been toggling between um, those things. So I'm just gonna um, share the full presentation. And yeah, um, would someone want to read these quotes? Um, maybe one person can take the first and another person can take the second. If you're available to speak, do you want to move you just like drop a star in the chat? Oh, I think Melanie got back. Melanie, you don't want to read the first one? Sure. Leadership is accepting responsibility for enabling others to achieve purpose in the face of uncertainty. Thank you, Melanie. And Cass, can you read the second? Yeah. Uh, organizing is leadership that enables people to turn the resources they have into power they need to make the change they want. Thank you. Um, so yeah, anybody can drop a star in the chat um, if you would like to respond to these two quotes or if, if you resonate or have any kind of reaction to them. Um, these are both quotes from Dr. Marshall Gantz um, from the handbook, Organizing People, Power, and Change. Um, and yeah, for me, like, the first time that I read um, these words, it was like kind of an enormous aha moment for me. I actually like jumped out of bed and like immediately like scrawled it on this poster board um, that I had hanging on my wall so that I could just like 
really ground myself um, because I think it, it really helps to show what we can bring as facilitators um, like into spaces really benefits from um, getting a chance to kind of like check my ego. And so um, these definitions just really helped me to sort of see what was possible in doing this work. Uh, would anybody else like to reflect on what these quotes mean to them? Cool. Uh, well, yeah, thank you for sharing that. Um, so just to sort of sum up um, some of the points about like how we can um, be building on our um, facilitation skills is that the art of facilitation involves listening to the group, um, providing supportive, positive energy. Um, also, we're going to endeavor to increase participation and try and hear all voices. Uh, a good meeting involves follow-up. Um, and so like, we're gonna send out an email after this. And um, even though I'm not directly involved with the strike, um, hopefully all of you will use these to continue um, following forward. Um, and also the art of facilitation will use tools, um, which will be the next section that we'll get to. Um, just to get a little bit more specific about how this can translate online, um, I think that it is really important to just recognize that we can start with what we already know and that there are a lot of ways to adapt um, the things that work well um, onto online spaces, that this isn't a situation where we actually need to reinvent the wheel. Like it could be a little bit more seamless think um, it's really important to stay human and um, to rec like I think that perfectionism happens a lot more online and then we do things like sit in the same position for way too long um, you know in online meetings it's a lot easier to um, get up and use the restroom um, so yeah just to like recognize that we actually need to stay human and that we can like show up with all of the things that don't allow us to translate into an online device. Um, so that that was one that I often need to remind myself of. Um, it's also really important to center relationships and connection. Um, so like it meant a lot for me that um, Julia and Melanie um, were sort of like catching up at the beginning of the call. Um, and I just, I really appreciate those spaces um, at the beginning and the end when we can get a little bit more casual. Um, I personally feel that breakout rooms is a space where um, we can easily center relationships and connection. Um, I would love to hear like what folks um, experience of their breakout rooms were, but like for me, like once it gets onto like a one-on-one -on -one or like a smaller group, I often find that I really relax a lot and that um, the pressure is kind of off and it's easier for me to sort of like show up as more of a human. Um, so, yeah, just recognizing that even though we're not in the same room, we still want to be creating spaces where um, we're not necessarily having to be on um, so that we can have some more relaxed time in our meeting. It's also great to um, like engage in different ways and invite um, collaborative activities. Um, so hopefully some of you enjoyed like hopping into the document or finding different ways to use the chat. Um, you know, I think that the training for change has lots of different skills for like ways to kind of mix up a presentation, um, doing like long monologue blocks of text um, is a way for people to tune out. Um, and one of the, that is to have multiple facilitators, which we didn't get a chance for this call, but in general, um, like having different voices, engaging in different ways. Um, Visuals also really helpful. Um, I was really thrilled to find the image of a uh, small pig eating an ice cream cone this morning to include it in our agenda slide. And um, like, there's a lot more ways to like bring in like memes and gifs and funny visuals and just appreciate all of the humor that we can bring online, which like really would never translate in person. So that's like, like having visuals online is a thing that can really augment and it's also something that like wouldn't really happen in person so definitely i encourage folks to lean into that um yeah, plan ahead so like melanie and i were able to like decide like who is going to be the host and um sort of like divide up some roles in that way um but it really makes a difference if you are able to uh, assign somebody onto a call who 
is maybe going to like manage the chat and answer any questions that come up in the chat or um, you know design the breakout rooms or um, other things like that. Um, a, a great team would have two facilitators and one tech person. Um, cool. So are there any questions um, before we move into the next section? Um, and I can stop sharing for a second if we all wanted to just have a moment to like reflect back on what we've gone through so far. Sorry, it may. I raised a question in the chat box. I don't know if it resonates for other people, but um, something that I've experienced is that um, we facilitate for different purposes. So sometimes we're facilitating an open discussion that's open-ended. Other times we're facilitating a meeting where the goal is to make a decision at that meeting, for instance. Mm -hmm. And that can be really hard to do if there's differing opinions, if there's conflict. So I think there are times when the facilitator is really like a, just like a neutral person, kind of like holding the container and the space. And there are other times where I've experienced being a facilitator where I have to more actively like try to blend, uh, look at like conflicts in the room or come up with a proposal that might blend those conflicts or like name di uh, dynamics that are going on under the surface. Um, and try to like name and reframe. So I was just wondering if people had that experience as well, like different different goals of facilitation and that they can be different depending on the space you're in. Yeah, uh, Juliet, Isabel, or Cass, would you like to respond? Yeah, I got a thought on that because I also have like, I've seen, I'm trying to think how to phrase this. I've seen um, places where people have different goals that aren't necessarily malicious, where at the end of the day, we're about the same purpose, but people want things in this space that might be mutually exclusive and a really skilled facilitator is able to kind of like diplomatically name that and figure out a way to hit enough of what each um, tendency needs that it still can move forward. And then I've also seen sort of different, different techniques. Um, so for example, kind of trying to force a decision used as like political weapons in a space that is malicious. So I think it's very kind of case dependent and it can be really tricky um and i a lot of the ways i've seen that people are able to manage that in real life i think are exponentially more difficult in digital space um, because it, so much of that relies on being able to kind of feel when okay so we're still arguing about this but we can kind of stop, reground, say we have a consensus and start moving on. Like you can kind of feel that in real life, whereas you can't really online. Um, so that was one thought I had. Yeah, totally. I think another thing that can happen in online spaces is that because we can't actually see sometimes how many people are in the room, a small number of people can like take over a conversation. And I think that and like not notice that the, that that's excluding the rest of the room. Um, and so, yeah, I just, I, I am, a, I'm agreeing with what you're saying, Julia. It's very, it's like infinitely harder in the online space. Yeah. I, I agree with what's been said. And I, I mean, I feel like, um, it's really challenging to consider what facilitation skills are going to be applicable in every setting because it is such a dynamic exercise um, and i do feel like conflict resolution looks really different online um, than it does in person especially because um, the like tells for what might be leading up to a conflict are so much harder to read like in person you might have a little bit more of an on-ramp of getting to kind of like read the energy before something occurs um, in a way that online it, things can sort of change a lot more suddenly. Um, and I, don't, I mean, 
you know, I think for a lot of us, um, like I'm a part of a group that specifically meets online because it's an international like cross country group. Um, but we have like a very clear specific, uh, purpose and, um, the group is built through word of mouth. So it's like really trust-based. Um, and so it's, it's like a really optimal, it's like designed to really use the benefits of like what's possible online. But I think that, you know, with the pandemic, we're now moving a lot of conversations online that otherwise um, would have happened in person. And I'm not sure that I have all the answers about like how to smooth out that transition, but it is, it does feel really valuable to name, um, you know, what is most complicated. Um, Isabella or Cass, would you like to jump in on this? Uh, well, yeah, um, Melanie and Juliet, um, I'm definitely welcome for their conversation. Um, I am hoping that up um, might address a few of these things. Um, so open to taking another question now. Um, also, I just want to note that we did start 15 minutes late, so um, we are probably going to end at 3.45 um, if, if that works for folks, or are there any time constraints? All right, seeing a thumbs up. Cool, thank you for that. Um, okay, well, I think that um, I'm going to jump back in. And let's see, one second. The screen, there we go, perfect. Okay, so these are some tools that um, I have found in different places um, that I facilitated and hopefully they're useful to you. Um, so the first is um, from the Autonomous University of Political Education, which I actually just mentioned as um, international um, discussion based group um, to speak about uh, Marxist education. And in this group, we use the popcorn method. Um, which means that after you speak, you name the next speaker. And in the popcorn method, we try and ensure that everybody speaks once before anybody speaks twice. Um, so, you know, for what Melanie and Juliet had named about the fact that like a few people can more easily dominate conversation online, uh, the popcorn method can really help by saying that like, we want to hear something from everybody, even if they just choose to pass um, before we hear a second round of thoughts. Um, and I think the popcorn method also really helps because one of the unique aspects of online spaces is that everybody's name is, you know, written um, ideally next to their face if they're sharing the video or at least, you know, their name is included on the screen. Um, and yeah, for anybody who's curious, if you have uh, your avatar um, there should be like a three dots which will allow you to rename yourself on zoom if you click on that um, so um, like Isabella if you did want to rename yourself um, and you like decided to hover over um, your square and you clicked on those three dots um, you could rename yourself to whatever of your choosing oops um, right, slide 14 um, so yeah the popcorn method has been something that um, has helped us to ensure that we hear everybody's voice. And then we also use the star method. Um, so if somebody does, you know, want to, um, you know, respond directly or like have a next thought, um, you know, they can just drop a star and it's easy to call on them next. Um, we also highly encourage the use of the chat, which I'm super grateful that um, everybody has been asking their questions and being so responsive in the chat. Uh, I apologize that it's hard for me to um, switch between the presentation and the chat sometimes. So I apologize that I've missed a couple things, but it's a really great practice. And I think it also like very much helps to build a sense of camaraderie in the group, especially when you can use the chat um, to like emphasize um, things that other people are saying. You're speaking and, and you wanna like um, thumbs up it or um, just, you know, reiterate what they said, um, that can feel really supportive and very helpful. Um, so like joking around, um, offering support, 
asking questions, clarifying ideas, using it as a space to um, speak more. Um, Cause it's like the chat is I think a pretty appropriate space to like really elaborate on thoughts. Um, even if it doesn't feel as appropriate to do it um, over the course of the conversation. So um, yeah, it's just like a really helpful, helpful part of Zoom. Um, and then, yeah, just, you know, etiquette is to mute when you're not speaking. Um, and um, in general, we always do a, a check-in and a check-out, um, which we'll talk about again in, I think, the next slide. Um, Juliet, uh, Juliet do, would you like to jump in now? Sure, um, just if it's helpful, uh, I've also been on a few calls where um, with being able to change your name, people also put their pronouns and if something's relevant to the call in. So for example, I've been doing some like tenant stuff. So you can put like your name, pronouns, and then also like your neighborhood. Um, so that is a good thing to know. Um, and then I was also going to add that like, I don't know, kind of like what Melanie and I were talking about with how uh, a lot of the skills that we have for in real life facilitation, uh, that it is very context dependent and what's appropriate sometimes isn't always appropriate. Um, there is a thing to be cautious about with the chat of, especially with really large meetings of getting like a side conversation going when it's um, a topic that's really contentious. Mm. So it can sometimes create like a really toxic dynamic of like, if people aren't speaking, but like talking in the chat and it like, it becomes kind of like this dual conversation going on that can be kind of not ideal. Um, but usually like in my experience, 90% of the time, the chat's great, but I just wanted to bring that up as an FYI for people. Yeah. I appreciate you saying that. Cause it, like for me, I've sort of had the opposite, um, like, like at least in the discussion based courses that I've had, like having side conversations has felt like it added um, more space um, to the conversation, but um, I can see how um, there are spaces where it feels really important to make sure that everybody is focused and, um, and not having like divergent side conversations. Um, Cass, did you wanna jump in? Yeah, I think um, one thing that I've seen done before is like if people need to go bathroom or need to take a break or something and they're away from the chat, the conversation in the name, like put a symbol or something to show that they're like away. And I think that's like a good way so you don't have to be in the chat like, hey, don't call on me. I'm not here right now. Like um, that's not interrupting the flow of the conversation. Oh, that's great. Thank you for sharing that. And Melly? Yeah, I just wanted to build on what Juliet said, because I remember being in a general assembly where I was presenting about Strike University, but there was like a side conversation going on around what counts as labor and emotional labor very intensively in the chat. And I think sometimes when that happens, um, that's also because there's a bit of a dysfunction in a meeting where like clearly there was a need for more conversation or something and it's being kind of ventilated in the chat and so I think one of the struggles as a facilitator is to like keep an eye on the chat and if the chat is like blowing up about a totally different topic than you're currently talking about maybe finding a tool to like pause and readdress that and also to assess again I think this is maybe a dynamic that happens in larger group meetings to assess like okay how many people are really having an intense conversation about this and how much is it like maybe two people that are that maybe that conversation doesn't need to take up space with the other like 80 or 90 or 100 people on the call so some of that is like assessments that facilitators have to do in real time i think yeah yeah i appreciate that um open to any final thoughts on on this topic Cool. Okay. Um, so we're going to jump back in. And um, yeah, I mean, I think that all of that is super valuable. And um, I don't personally actually have that much experience facilitating calls. Uh, that's not true. I mean, I facilitated calls with like 300 people on them. And it feels like there's like a, 
a kind of like critical mass where it's like when you have too many people, then the chat is very challenging to have a coherent conversation in um, because there's just like so many voices coming at you with all different sorts of perspectives. But yeah, I appreciate that example, Melanie. I think that's that's really valuable to think about. Um, okay, so another tool that I had to offer um, was sort of similar to the, the spectrum that we used at the beginning, which was a chance to kind of get like a um, like a temperature check, um, but we can also use like a similar uh, tool to actually reach consensus. And so um, this is a tool, the gradients of agreement, and um, it's from a training resources group. Um, so the image shows a like full gradient from one to eight, um, but in my experience, um, we've actually just used a gradient from one to six. Um, one being agree and can participate, two agree but cannot, three agree but suggest change in tactic, four abstain, five disagree but will not block, and six disagree with a block that um, will like prevent the motion from going forward because um, there's a concern for harm. Um, so for instance, I could propose a motion that we move to the next slide. And um, you know everybody could say that they agree and and would participate with that, or maybe somebody would say they agree but they cannot participate that they're actually going to leave the meeting, but they agree with everybody else moving forward. Um, some folks might say that they agree, but um, that they want to have a discussion or that they want to um, you know change the tactic of just moving forward. Um, and yeah, the Zoom poll is also a really, a really great way to do this. Um, so yeah, four would be not making a decision. Um, five would be disagreeing, but um, still allowing it to go forward. And six would be to disagree and say like, no, don't move to the next slide because it would harm my ability to understand this point or don't move to the next slide because um, actually we need to like, reassess the whole point of this presentation and um, or like, you know, any other kind of form of harm um, that might happen. So um, with that, I, I invite us all to vote on whether or not we should go to the next slide. Cool. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to take that. As Thank you for participating. And um, yeah, my next, my next point is how to set an agenda. Uh, thank you, Juliet. Um, so yeah, just really quick, um, have an opening and, and a closing. Topics, um, keep report back short. Um, I think that in general, there's sort of consensus in meetings that report backs can happen um, like in spaces outside of the meeting, like it can be done through email or like that most report backs are actually only necessary for like a small number of people. Um, and so really to try and keep announcements to five minutes or less. Um, when setting the goals of the meeting, you can ask yourself, what will serve the group the most today? What, we can, what can we realistically cover? And what can we do at this meeting to set us up for success in the next meeting? Um, and then also part of an agenda at the end is to set next steps and to follow up. So um, just to make a quick note about trolls, um, I haven't personally experienced this, but um, it is happening more and more frequently that um, Zoom is, um, you know, being uh, open to these types of attacks. So um, I've copied a link um, for a toolkit that can help us um, prepare ourselves um, in case there were going to be uh, like Zoom bombers or trolls um, trying to de derail a meeting. And, you know, particularly if you're discussing a controversial topic in a large group that is public facing, um, there's a lot, there's ways that you want to make sure to um, prepare yourself for this, um, for this event. So you can use waiting rooms, um, which will allow you to decide who enters the meeting. And it's kind of a screening process. Um, so hopefully you would recognize all the names of the folks who are coming. Um, you can set up, set up an RSVP, which is also a way of um, adding in a kind of screening layer to the process. 
Um, you can set multiple hosts to a meeting, um, which is really helpful because um, then multiple people could respond. Um, if there was somebody that needed to be removed or blocked from the meeting, um, and it would also allow hosts to um, reclaim um, the screen. So yeah, the, the trolls might um, function through the chat, through audio, audio um, disruption or through video disruption. Um, and having multiple hosts allows you to more effectively uh, mitigate their like um, interference. Um, it's a good note not never to use the personal meeting ID for your Zoom account because that ID is um, like uh, static, and if if it becomes public, then um, the uh, you know anybody would be able to join your Zoom account moving forward at any time. So it's it's really best practice to never use your personal meeting ID for anything public and always generate an, a unique code for your meeting. Um, and if you're on a very large meeting, like the kind that Melanie was describing, um, it could be useful to disable the one-on-one -on -one chat, um, which will prevent um, like harassment from happening, you know, outside of the view of what the hosts are able to see. Um, I, yeah, I think that there is a setting that allows others um, not to share their screen, um, but that doesn't prevent them from like, you know, sharing their own video. Um, apparently it's happening fairly common in um, the um, high school groups um, where someone will just uh, join a high school Zoom and expose themselves, which is really upsetting. Um, but it's like not that they take over the screen it's just that they do it um you know in their own frame um and so yeah i think that there's like some pretty d good discussion um and yeah i think there's some pretty good discussion around um what can be done uh what settings are the most useful i know that zoom as a company is is trying to create more protective measures um i don't have a lot of firsthand experience with this but i do um encourage you all to take a look um at the at the link which again i found from the strike university um, facilitator manual um cool so just my my last um am i still okay here we go um so yeah my last slide is just an opportunity to discuss how to give feedback um, and i also encourage everyone to give feedback on this presentation uh, which you can do using the link that i just dropped um and so this is a, a chart that um we use in the Sunrise Movement um, to discuss um, what can be um, helpful in giving feedback, recognizing that um, the best kind of feedback um, has both a high level of care and respect that you're giving feedback to, as well as a high level of directness in terms of being specific about what the kind of feedback that you're giving is. Um, and um, this gives us the opportunity to explore um, what it looks like if we are not providing feedback that has both a high level of care and a high um, level of directness. So if you're um, being, you know, very um, obtuse and obscure and not speaking directly, um, but, you know, sh sharing um, that you care a lot about the person, um, this is what we call ruinous empathy. Um, and this can look like just, um, you know, encouraging the, the person without um, actually addressing um, what could be helpful for them to improve upon moving forward. Uh, so it's just like, oh, you did so great. Like, oh, you're amazing. That was so wonderful. Like, it doesn't matter that like you were on mute for like half of the time that you, or you know, like whatever the, um, the uh, like aspect of feedback might be. Um, uh, to provide feedback with, both low directness and low care looks like manipulative insecurity um, and it's really just mean um, as well as to provide feedback with low direction low care and high directness which might also look like throwing shade or um just um yeah being uh you know very very nitpicky about a person so that would be obnoxious aggression um so some great tips is to be specific to be relational uh, to orient yourself uh, towards the goal of you know what the point of um, the activity is and to have positive and constructive feedback um, to help it with growth um, so 
please do uh, feel free to provide any feedback on this presentation um, using the form that I that I um, posted. Um, and here are some resources which um, can uh, you know help situate facilitation moving forward. So there's some links for training for change. Um, they have a, a lot of really in-depth resources. Um, also different facilitation tips from Sunrise. Um, the Strike U um, guidelines are really fantastic and provided like a lot of the backbone for this presentation. So um, thank you, Strike U. Um, and yeah, feel free to reach out. So um, with that, um, I open it up for any questions. And um, at the end of questions, I suggest that we do a, a closing exercise of um, hands, head, and heart, which I think is a really, really lovely exercise just to kind of pull some things together. Um, so yeah, uh, are there any questions on that section? I know Juliet mentioned that uh, they had some response around what can be done with, with trolls. Oh, yeah, I just had a question, actually. Um, can you, like, as if you host, dump a single person if you end up with that random? Okay, yeah. cool. I was wondering that. Um, and then I had another thought that I was thinking of more if I end up facilitating online as a teacher, that I think it would be good, like an ethical instructor, to let students know ahead of time that if they down, if the chat is downloaded, private messages are included in that download, which is also a good thing that everybody should know, because I'm gonna get in trouble with that, or I would have if I didn't know that. But um, if you send like a private one-to-one -one message, those are included in the chat logs, which I think is like a good thing to let um, students know if you're an instructor or people, if you're a facilitator or whatever, just ethically, so. Yeah, I didn't actually know that. That's, that's um, and yeah, I'm, I'm now I'm curious. I feel like I'm gonna start saving the chat more to see like what gets said <laughs> that's like the yeah it's it's a scary piece of info that i'm like oh no i hope there's a couple that i have people didn't download whoops melanie did you want to hop in um yeah i was similarly shocked when i learned that julia so thank you for naming it um i wanted to ask i i don't uh, want to take up too much of our time because i know we want to do a closer close but i wondered if people could surface some of the like any of like harder things they've faced in facilitation settings and if they have any um advice i'm just thinking of like kind of tips and tricks for the for the tricky times um where a conversation feels really stuck i feel like in real life i know if a conversation's really stuck i'm like okay let's take a break or let's um do small groups or let's like everybody do some free writing for a minute or two or come back together i don't know and i'm not sure how that would work in an online space so i just kind of wanted to see if folks had any ideas about that yeah that's a really great question i don't know um like i'm i was really struck by what uh we talked about earlier which i thought was a great point that we should like trust what we already know um like that for some reason clicked something in my head where i'm like okay you know it the online feels new but it's actually not because we're still people trying to do something collectively um so i don't know like i would wonder if a lot of those things would still work in order to like have people take a break and re-engage like you could just be like okay so all right if things got heated Let's take five, everyone come back. When you're back, like put in the chat something that brought you. Like so that type of thing, I feel like it would maybe help. Um, I don't know. Cass? Yeah, I was gonna say that definitely taking like the break actually works. You know, we're like, you know, people seem tired. Let's just take five minutes and then we'll come back and talk about it. Another thing that's helped is with trying to like come up with ideas like almost a little free write in the chat where people just kind of like what do people envision for this and people just start putting in their ideas in the chat and then we kind of like go through people's ideas and it really like helps especially with people that don't feel comfortable talking it really helps kind of facilitate answers from the group yeah i love that uh, i would also say that um you know there there is a sort of online equivalent to 
the steps that Melanie suggested. Like, I think taking breaks is actually really important online, especially because I think people tend to engage online with like less comfort. So it's like, I'm somebody who like, I need to stand up and like get out of my chair like every hour and a half um, or else it's just, it's really hard for me. Um, so I think taking breaks is really important, like in all contexts. Um, I think that like for me, I've had really positive um, experience with breakout rooms, um, especially because I find that like the fact that it is a little bit more random than like how I might choose to interact with people um, in a, like real life has actually helped me to like open up more to folks that I otherwise might not have engaged with. Um, but yeah, I, I mean, I do think, yeah, building stretching activities into meetings is awesome. Um, and so, yeah, I would also say that it really does to like do free rights. And I think I'm somebody who has really benefited from the invitation to like, break from the meeting to to write for five minutes i think like a lot of it for me like does kind of come into a, a this sort of posture it's like the posture that i have in front of the computer is so much more rigid than how i sit in an in-person meeting um and so yeah it's like having that opportunity to like invite folks to um to sort of use their body in different ways um really does help um, I think in the specific context of like how to create space through challenging moments um, that th like there is an opportunity to like offer to like take a deep breath together as a group and I will drop a, a useful website that um, helps with that. Um, and then are, are there any other um, reflections on this point or other questions? Um, I, well, I wanted to lift up what Cass said in the chat about playing music during breaks. I also love the idea of like having people put a goofy background up or share a meme or like in some things when I want to do a quick check in at a training, but I don't have time to do a go round if it's a large group. I'm just like, oh, drop an emoji about how you feel like so then you can get just like an emoji sense of what people's vibe is. Um, yes, Zoom costume party. Yeah, that's awesome. Uh, that's yeah. So I think that there are a lot of ways to try and like make it fun and, and bring things in. I love the suggestion of like bringing in different images um, through like emojis or gifs or anything like that. Um, yeah, it's really helpful. Take um, one more question or comment. Well, yeah, um, if everyone feels available, I'd love to do a closeout of just um, head, hands, and heart. So to say um, something that you learned, uh, something that you feel, and um, something that you're gonna like take away from this, or like, yeah, something that you're thinking about, something that you're feeling, and like some kind of skill or, or thing that you're taking away from this. Um, and yeah, if, if folks are available for it, I would, I would love to just get a chance to close the meeting this way. Um, would anyone like to start or would you like me to, to model the exercise? Um, okay, I can model it. Um, so yeah, um, I feel really grateful for the opportunity to get to um, bring this uh, to everybody. Thank you for, um, you know, deciding to take this training. Um, I think that in my head, um, I feel pretty inspired about how much opportunity um, there is to connect. Um, and, and I think that um, like I, I'm trying to think of ways to um, embrace like more possibilities in you know, what could be discussed in this space. Um, in my heart, I'm like really feeling inspired by the knowledge that was brought into this meeting by everyone. Um, I just, I feel really grateful for um, like how much was shared and like the depth of the conversation. Um, and so I just, I feel um, like a lot of um, 
yeah, just like respect for everybody who's here. Um, and I think, yeah, in my hands, um, like a skill or a learning that I will take away from this um, is, I think, a, maybe a, a desire to be more explicit about um, kind of like dividing roles. Like, I think I, I would like to um, have gotten a chance to um, like hold what was happening in the chat um more readily with um what the kind of like flow of the conversation was and so um thinking of ways to kind of better balance that um but yeah i'm just really grateful for everyone being here uh juliet would you like to go next sure um same echoing that i would say uh in my um in my head I'm like I'm I'm thinking about um actually exactly what I was talking about earlier about how we actually do have a lot of knowledge and it's doesn't it's not as unfamiliar as it seems um and trusting that and uh I like I feel way more confident about um abilities to do online facilitation in um, a more effective and like less kind of alienated way, which is really exciting. Uh, and um, really, this is kind of like jumping over um, all of the different topics, but um, I'm really just interested in like potential of this for leftist organizing internationally in a way that I had trouble, I think, imagining or like actually like feeling tangible before um that's really exciting to me so i've been feeling very gloomy about being stuck behind a computer screen and um all those kind of especially those tangible skills at the end of how to kind of humanize it i'm feeling a lot more kind of positive about it so yeah thank you all you want to popcorn it to someone Let's do it. Uh, who's still on the call? Let's do Cass. Okay. Um, I'm a little confused on the prompts. What are they? <laughs> Sorry. Oh, yeah. So it's just like head, heart, and hand. So it's like something that you're thinking about, something that you're feeling, and some kind of thing that you learned or like a skill that you're like holding. Oh, okay. Um, so what I'm thinking about... Um, I guess I'm thinking about how I'm going to, I'm thinking about like how I'm going to apply these in like future meetings and like just, um, yeah, logistically, like how am I gonna put these in different contexts and different meetings? And I'm kind of interested to see like how it's gonna fit academic organizing or even personal senses. Um, what I'm feeling, I'm feeling really like happy that I got these like, I guess because I'm used to um, trainings that are very people I know that have the same kind of um, circulating ideas and getting new input from like people from different orgs and different places, it's really like refreshing because I've never heard like any, uh, well not any of these, but you know, it's, you know what I mean. Um, and the hand, what, what was that? A skill I have? Oh, um, basically like, everything I learned in here um, is like a cool skill I learned. Definitely like, um, I guess like how to manage like uh, the chat and kind of work in tandem with talking face to face, well, computer to computer, and also communicating through written and through the faces, through the verbal and those kind of navigating and intermixing those different routes. Okay, um, let me see. Um, Isa, are you on here? Isabella? I'm here. <laughs> Hi. Hi, yeah. Thank you so much for all of that. Um, I think I'm thinking about, uh, well, actually, I'm going to go in reverse, I think. <laughs> um, so something that I learned that was uh, immediately practical was just how to change my name. I didn't even <laughs> know that I could do that, so thank you. <laughs> I'm very non-proficient with Zoom. Uh, so all of the sort of technical things I really appreciated, and I also appreciated 
um, getting to see in live action the collaboration happening on the shared file, which I think is a really um, smart way to sort of get around this platform that might not be able to meet all the needs that we have for the things that we do. Um, I'm feeling very motivated. I think that um, I definitely can relate to people who have expressed that the online platform can be really um, alienating and can just be tiresome in certain ways, connectivity issues and that sort of thing. So I think this is sort of like re-energized uh, my attitude towards doing these kind of digital online meetings. Um, and I'm just thinking about, I, I obviously taking into account what other people have said as well, definitely reflecting on the potential um, and sort of again, in a c c connection with what I said before about what I'm feeling, like changing my whole attitude about the potential of um, online and Zoom and such sort of meetings for um, achieving shared goals, which I think I've been reluctant to accept or come around to accepting. So yeah, thank you very much. Thank you, Isa. Um, Melanie, do you want to close us out? Sure, yeah. Um, let's see, Head. I am, um, I think I'm puzzling over two things in a good way. One is um, like facilitating towards decision making. Those were like, I kept coming with those questions because I've just had a lot of bad experiences facilitating that kind of thing. Um, and the second is just thinking about how the move towards like all of our interactions being online because of COVID, like just seeing unexpected positive um, sides to that. And uh, especially for cross-campus organizing, Julia, you, you named international organizing. Remus, you also brought that into the room. So like in certain ways, Strike You could only have existed under these conditions, I feel like. Um, and I'm not sure that we would all be meeting from all these different places across the country if it weren't this these times. So um, I'm reflecting on how to make the most of that. Um, and heart, I'm just feeling super grateful, Remus, for you to share this. I felt like it spanned like really intro stuff to really high level stuff and was like, and I think, I feel like you'd modeled so much of the facilitation skills you were trying to teach us. And that was really cool. And I can imagine also like hard. Um, and hands, I don't know, I, I keep thinking about hands and then like feeling like I have like each finger has like a new trick that I can use when I feel stuck. I'm like, okay, we can do the brainstorm chat or like everybody can, um, you know, we can do a stretch break or play music or whatever. So. I'm feeling like full of new um, tricks and I'm excited to like try them out. Oh, thank you so much. Uh, it's really great to hear back from everybody. And I'm so grateful that um, you could join us. So yeah, if you do wanna um, drop your um, email into the chat, then we can make sure to send you um, some resources. Um, and um, I believe that this recording will be on Strike University's website, um, as well as the slides. Um, so, yeah, I think that that is everything. And um, thank you again so much for coming. It was lovely to meet you. Thank you so um, much. Yeah. Yeah, if everybody wants to unmute, I think it's really nice at the end to like unmute and all say goodbye together. <laughs> thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Have a great afternoon. Bye. Yeah. Bye.